All right, for today, I wanted to discuss different periods that occur within literature. This is obviously going to be tilted towards American and English literature because obviously those are the primary subjects of our English course here. However, we could do this same kind of thinking and apply it to Latin American literature or Asian literature or literature from India and the subcontinent or Islamic literature or native tales from Africa because the principles that we're going to talk about, even though that they line up with English and American literature, or what we would say the Western canon, the official great books of the Western world, we could do this to any geography or any culture once we understand this kind of thinking. So that's what I wanted to discuss, that in order to interpret the literature that you students are reading, we need some ways of thinking. So yes, we could go back to the days of the ancient um, quill pen, or the modern pencil, or even the stylus that we use for working on a touch screen or a digital pen pad. It doesn't matter where we are in history, the way that we organize these periods of literature is really a pretty standard system. But I'll give you one general rule, and that's a little inside joke because this is Napoleon, the great French general in the picture. History is messy and imprecise. When we say something is of the 20th century, then we really don't mean from the year 1900 because 20th century kind of slides around. You know, the airplane was invented in 1903, not in 1900, and that certainly had an impact on transportation. Uh, Jordan, if you would mute your microphone, please, because I'm getting some background noise from you. Thank Sorry. You so no problem. So history does not line up for us in perfect 10-year groups every decade or every century. Instead, history, and this is um, a philosophical saying, history is written, written by the victors. Whoever wins the war tends to get to write the books about it, and they get to name the battles and all those things. In this little picture of Napoleon, you see that the great pyramids are in the background because he was exploring Egypt and had a great battle there and a great victory. So in France, of course, he had coins made with his face on one side and the pyramids on the other, and he called it the Battle of the Pyramids. Well, in fact, the battle took place in a bean field near the pyramids. But if you call it the Battle of the Bean Field, it doesn't sound nearly as dramatic or as historic, right? So things get called things and it can be a little bit slippery, but overall, we can make chunks of history of literature and group kinds of things together. So that's what I want to do, because as we go into different periods of writing, you may see that that writing has changed and the kinds of stories are different. So we want to understand what groups to put stuff in. The literary periods are not perfect decades or centuries, but there are certain trends and styles of writing that might be dominant, that might be the, the way most writers were doing things in those days. So if we're aware of that, we can look at that style and go, oh, well, this must have been written during medieval times, or this could have been written before the Civil War, and we can get a general flavor of where these things are coming from. We can also separate history by major events. So it's not just time, but it's events. I expect that someday historians will look at COVID and say that there was American society before COVID and after COVID. So even though the period of COVID might be 2020 to 2022, we know that that's kind of a dividing line in world history, that that disease changed the 
excuse me, the way people think and travel and change politics. Just like the terrorist attacks of 9-11 changed things. Uh, you didn't have to take off your shoes at the airport before 9-11. So the emphasis on safety when you fly, that changed. We talk about periods of history like post-war, by which we mean post-World War II. We talk about architecture as antebellum, which is Latin for before the war. But in that case, they're talking about the American Civil War, and they're talking about the architecture of the South, like in Virginia or the Carolinas. So major wars, major historic events also changed the way literature was written and published. So being aware that history and literature kind of run on parallel train tracks and that the stations are not 1900, 1800, 1700, but it's major events of history, or it could be major authors that give us that definition. This book right here is from the Harvard Classics. It's a, it's a collection of 50 books that's all the great literature of the world. I finally put a set together. All of mine were published in 1909, so you can imagine it doesn't have a lot of new stuff in it. But in very fine detail on the back of the book, we can see that it refers to Elizabethan drama. So it's not any particular author, but it's the period of plays that were published and performed during Queen Elizabeth I. Not the queen who died last year, but the queen who was the daughter of Henry VIII. So we're talking hundreds of years ago. This is Shakespeare's time period. But we can collect things by who was the king, who was the queen, or what war was just fought before and after this period, or was America still a colony or not? So history influences where we draw our dividing lines in literature. And literature can be quite a mess when we try to organize it. I mean, we could put all the red books on one shelf, but that wouldn't tell us anything, right? We need to group them by kinds of subjects, or in this case, by time periods. So we have classical, medieval, renaissance, romantic, realism and naturalism, modernist, and contemporary. You don't need to know them. That's not a list that's going to be on a quiz, but I want you to be thinking that literature can be put into these groups and that you will have kinds of stories that kind of occur together. This bookstore, in fact, is an actual bookstore that I that I go to that it's called Abraxas Books. It's downtown on Beach Street, uh, kind of near the minor league baseball stadium. And every time I go downtown, I go in there and look. Sometimes he's got free books on a cart out front, but it really is organized. Those different bookshelves are sections of different subjects, but it's kind of a cool thing to go in there and look around and see all the different things that people have written and collected knowledge between the covers of a book. The first period that we could look at, we would call classical. So this is where your epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey, the story of the Trojan War, the great philosophy of the Greeks and Romans. So we have mythology and stories of Hercules, things like that or the first actual plays that were being performed. And the time period that we would use to define it would be from about 1200 BCE, meaning before the Common Era. We no longer mark history as before Christ and after. BC and AD, we go before the Common Era. So everybody in history has kind of agreed where the year zero is. And then 455, we get into positive numbers, and that's when the Roman Empire fell. So anything from the time of the ancient Greeks, Greeks and Egyptians and, and that era through when Rome fell, when Rome was no longer the most powerful empire on earth, that's the classical period. So there was a high point of civilization, of great writings, drama, philosophy, the myths of of the great gods like Hercules, things like that. 
the great histories like the Trojan War. This is the classical period. We're talking about the area around the Mediterranean Sea, so Italy, Greece, Egypt, Turkey, in that area, and in that time period when those were the dominant cultures. Again, as a footnote, we're leaving out Persia, we're leaving out ancient China, we're leaving out ancient India, Africa and South American tales. They're not part of this because we're emphasizing the roots of British and American literature. So we're kind of drawing a straight line through those cultures, but we could use this same tool to look at other empires, other rulers in other parts of the world. So this is just a way of thinking about a limited amount of literature. In the medieval period, some people call it the Dark Ages, but that's not entirely correct. But medieval, we kind of see the word medium or in between. This is the period between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance, when Leonardo da Vinci and all the new science and art and things were happening around Europe. But that period in between was not a dead period for literature. So we have the stories of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and the legend of Robin Hood and um, other knights and quests and epic things that were going on, stories like Beowulf. So there are things that happened in these days that were worth being written of and that we still look at that literature, but it's definitely different than what the ancient Greeks and Romans were doing. And we mark that history from when the Roman Empire fell up to the beginnings of, some historians called it the Age of Exploration. Right before Columbus sails off to accidentally discover America and other sailors from Spain and Portugal were discovering around the coast of Africa and over to India. So when these things were going on, you had changes in science and politics and it marks a turning point in history that is also part of this renaissance that we're about to discuss. Renaissance is just the French word for rebirth. There is a renewed interest in the classic literature because the church had been recopying all the old Greek and Roman books. So now this was being studied again and inspiring new literature. This is the time of Shakespeare. This is when some very technical poetry was first being put forward. So the sonnet, which is a form of poetry, it's 14 lines. Always it's 14 lines. So it's a technical kind of poetry with a particular kind of rhyming pattern. And there was an Italian way of doing it. And then there is the English or Shakespearean way of doing it. So we started to have a science of language, a science of poetry coming out. And this is when Shakespeare and others were writing the plays that we remember, like Hamlet, which is in the picture, or Macbeth, or Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, right? These famous plays were coming out of this era. Roughly, we're going to say the year 1300 to 1600. And if you remember the previous slide, we said exploration was 1585. So history periods and literature periods do not perfectly match. They don't have perfect dividing lines because depending on if you are English or Italian or Spanish or Portuguese, your history lines are going to be a little bit different because your kings are going to have different years when they were in power. Your authors will have published in slightly different times. So it's going to be close but it's never going to be that all the countries changed their style of poetry all on the same day in 1485. Doesn't work like that. But we can say within this 300 year period, this was a dominant way of literature and Shakespeare and his poems and plays would be our best example perhaps of that. The romantic period, now we start to actually have America being part of the picture. So we have the Puritans, the first settlers up in Massachusetts, bringing their religious ideas and religious influences and Bible references, allusions, 
were appearing in some of the stories. Even in the Scarlet Letter, one of the main characters in that is a preacher. So this is the first of the stories that are really emotional. This is the first of the stories that actually had a female hero because Hester and the Scarlet Letter might be the first American female hero in any literature. So we're starting to get kind of a spiritual thing. We're getting an American flavor. Some of you have already written a paper comparing Emerson and Thoreau, who were both transcendentalists, who were not so much religious, but spiritual and had this sense of nature and that nature had an influence on people and their spirit and their emotions, their ways of thinking. And then there were the dark romantics who were a little bit creepy, maybe a little bit uh, in the horror vein. And Edgar Allan Poe would be a great example of that. Many of his poems were sad, romantic tributes to women he had loved and lost. So he was not only speaking about death, but also romance that he had felt. So we could say that this is 1790 to 1870, roughly from the founding of the United States through this American Civil War period. So we've got about a hundred year roughly period that American literature is starting to figure out what it is and express American ways of thinking. So there's going to be some religious basis to it and then some originality in the way that Americans were expressing their sadness and their emotions. So this, this is an important period. Moving forward, after the Civil War, instead of having the fantasy and horror type things that Edgar Allan Poe and his type might have been writing about, now the stories are very real. They're very natural. There's nothing fantastic happening in them. Yes, there was some science fiction. There was some horror being written in these days. But mostly the stories were about things happening in the real world, situations that were believable. So your stories about man versus nature, your great sailing stories like Moby Dick or adventure stories like the call of the wild up in the Alaska gold rush period, all of your westward expansion of people moving out and exploring the, the frontier. This is that era when America is expanding to the West and you have the challenges of the Rocky Mountains and the great Western deserts and the, the winters in Alaska trying to prospect for gold or sailing ships going over to China and back. So mutiny on the bounty would be in this period. So all your great adventures of people doing heroic things out in the wilderness and the wild world, I could make this a group of the realists and the naturalists. In fact, sometimes the hero of the story is not fighting a villain. They're not fighting somebody else. They are fighting the sea, the desert, the winter, the mountains. Oh, yeah, I see the note that loving the movie and the book. The movie's been made, I think, four different times. Uh, the most recent one had Harrison Ford and the dog was computer animation. But it's a story that you can tell over and over again and audiences can relate to it because it's real. And if you think about all the survival shows on TV – where they take people and put them out in the woods and they try and survive or, uh, you know, live in, in the jungle for a week, different things like that. We still have a human interest in the battle against nature because nature is so big and powerful. And as people, we are so small and puny. So, yes, this era of literature is important. It has that theme of being very realistic. Nature is almost a character. Nature is the opponent because we're battling against the sea or against the elements or against the jungle. And it can be measured by that westward expansion of Americans uh, heading out across the Rocky Mountains, heading for California and so on. The modernist era, now we're starting to get into 20th century literature. 
we have a great influence of the jazz age, which is the Roaring Twenties, the gangster era, alcohol prohibition, um, the Roaring Twenties, because it seemed like America was making all kinds of money, that the cities were getting big. We had airplanes. We we're starting to have automobiles, radio. So a lot of new technology was influencing things. I could make a claim that The Great Gatsby is the perfect example of a book that takes place in this era. So it's after World War One. World War II hasn't happened yet. The Great Depression hasn't happened yet. So everybody is running around big cars, big money, having a good time. But this romance soap opera is taking place during this period. One thing that I think these modern stories do is they make current event references so we can fix them at a period in time that one of the characters in the book, for example, supposedly was in on the fix of the 1918 World Series or 1919 World Series. So we know when those ball games were played, we know that really happened. We know that alcohol was prohibited in the United States by constitutional amendment. So gangsters were running illegal alcohol around. We know that movies were just getting started. One of the characters in the book is a female professional golf player. So we know when that sport was becoming professional and that was going on. So the modern idea of these novels and stories is that there are things in there that the reader can say, oh yeah, I remembered when that happened, or I know what that car is, I've seen that kind of car, or yes, I had a brother that fought in that war. And there's real stuff going on that the readers can relate to. So we look at this as being the period from before World War I, but after the invention of the airplane, so 1910-ish, through the end of World War II, which was 1945. So we have this era where we had two world wars and the Great Depression happened in between them. The, the novel The Grapes of Wrath is about a family who is leaving Oklahoma during the Great Depression and trying to get to California where they hope they have more opportunity. Again, a very American story, but based on real things that were actually happening, even the Dust Bowl, the drought that happened in America at that time was a real thing, and it was a real thing in the book, so that we can relate to this stuff because we saw it happen. If you were a reader alive in those times, you're reading these books as if it's going on right now because it mentions things you have heard of and dates and places and events that that's real stuff. So now maybe I take the novel more seriously because it has so many real things in it that it mentions. Then we get to the contemporary period. And you see at the end of the slide, I refer to it as 1945 to now. And I use that phrase post-war, meaning World War II. That is um, an, a major dividing line in world history. After that war was over, several things changed. We had the American and European group of countries, and we had the Russian and communist group of countries. So there was worldwide tension. The first atomic bomb was used to end World War II. So we can talk about it as the atomic age. This is when jet airplanes became big. So some people called it the jet age. So we see science and technology are a big part of this as well as world politics. But I think we can go deeper. Current social issues get discussed in these contemporary pieces of literature. So we might see feminism, racism, economics being the underlying theme of some of these books and stories. That on the surface, oh, it's an interesting romance or it's an interesting mystery. Fine. But also underneath it, we are learning something about race relations or the place of women in society or the effect of technology on people or the economics of the city versus the country. 
So there are deep lessons to learn about what is going on in modern life underneath the surface story, which could be some mystery or adventure or romance. But underneath it, there's a larger lesson for us to learn. So this commentary on what is good or bad in society is blended in with the plot. So that makes the theme of the story, good conquering evil or equality of the races or women having an important role, whichever it is that the author is trying to put across is blended into the plot and really is the reason for writing the story. The author is not writing the story because it's an interesting mystery. The author is writing the story to express something about discrimination in the Deep South. So in the photograph, we see Gregory Peck reading the book To Kill a Mockingbird that was adapted into the movie that Gregory Peck was actually acting in. So I think that's kind of cool that the guy at the movie, who is the actor on the set, is reading the book that is what he is acting out in the movie right at the same time. So I thought that would be kind of a cool picture to put in here to tie all of that stuff together. Now, we do have a rise of something that we call genre fiction, and it had been going on earlier, but something that is a straight mystery or a straight science fiction or horror story Sometimes those books are put out purely to be entertainment. They're not trying to teach us any deep lesson. So, yes, it's literature, but if you go to Walmart and buy a paperback book and it it's just a horror story, okay, I can read it for entertainment and it can be scary and thrilling, but it's not teaching me anything great about the nature of the American economy. It's not teaching me anything about the relationships of people in families. I'm not learning any deep thought out of it. I'm just waiting to see them get the vampire in the end. So it's a, it's an entertainment. And genre is just the French word that means type. So we have these types of stories. We have horror stories, science fiction stories. We have Westerns, we have mysteries, and that's fine. But that's not what we mean by contemporary literature. I enjoy those kinds of stories. I enjoy those adventures and they're entertaining, but that's not where I get my deep meaning of understanding my role in the universe or how I should relate to other people or the progress of American history. I'm not learning anything deep from reading a Western where a guy gets on a train and goes and catches the robbers. That's just a good way to kill an afternoon and enjoy a story and learn anything deep out of that. When we talk about contemporary literature, we mean novels like To Kill a Mockingbird or In Cold Blood, which is a whole novel about the nature of crime and criminals, which is in the tradition even of the way the Russians wrote novels about crime and criminals. So if there's a deeper meaning, if there's a a bigger lesson to be had, then I think we can classify it as contemporary literature rather than just entertainment in a paperback book. Both of them are okay, but in our discussion of understanding literature, I think that contemporary literature is that which teaches us about the nature of people and societies and relationships and politics and the development of understanding. That happens underneath the entertaining story because To Kill a Mockingbird is an entertaining story, but underneath it, it teaches an awful lot about race and family and society, along with the way of telling us an entertaining story. Underneath it, we learn a lot of other things. All right, that's my basic organization of this presentation, how I would look at literary periods. One thing I hope you noticed is that our literary periods got a lot shorter. I mean, the classical period was well over a thousand years, almost 2000 years. And the medieval period was another six, 700 years, right? But these more modern periods of history, 
they're happening 30, 40 years and it changes and becomes something else. I would almost consider that to be a theme, to reuse the literary term, a theme of this presentation. The rate of social change is faster in modern times than it has been in ancient times. Could that be because we have the internet and people can know things more quickly from all around the world? Maybe. Could that be because we have modern travel and you could get up this morning and be in France tomorrow or Japan tonight? You know, that kind of thing changes a society because the influences are happening more rapidly. We have access to more knowledge, more trade, more technology. And sadly, our wars happen more often. They happen closer together. And between technology and politics and conflict, yeah, maybe it changes the way we tell our stories more quickly from style to style. We might have a new style being developed right now, and we'll look back 50 years now and say, yeah, long about uh, 2015, 2020, Yep, things were changing, and then the stories look differently from COVID afterward. That could be a whole nother historical thing for professors in the future to look at. But I do think that the rate of technology change, the rate of social change, the rate of communication between cultures, as that increases, I think it changes our storytelling more frequently. That's my theory. You can take it or leave it. But I think we can see from these periods of literature, there might be something to it, that the kinds of literature change more rapidly. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording and then open the floor for any questions.